Bueno, pues eh, esto que parece un sueño, esto que parece algo loco, el sorteo, al menos a la mayoría de la gente en España le suena a los premios de Navidad, ¿no? Eh, parece eh, que, que sí que está pasando en otros, en otros países de, del mundo y nosotros hemos tenido la gran suerte de poder invitar a algunos de ellos y en, en particular vamos a empezar con la experiencia digamos, eh, que abarca un cambio más ambicioso en su, en su propio país, que es una experiencia de, trans, de cambio constitucional. Es decir, que puede haber más, eh, más interesante o más ambicioso que cambiar la propia constitución de un país. Bueno, pues eso es lo que, lo que se ha hecho en Irlanda con esta clase de procesos. Entonces, eh, bueno, pues quiero invitar al, al siguiente panel, eh, quiero invitar a David Farrell y a um, Luis Catwell, por favor, si pueden, eh, y les voy a presentar. Eh, David eh, Farrell es profesor eh, de, de, de la Universidad, eh, del Colegio Universitario de Dublín y es el director de lo que es la Asamblea Constitucional Irlandesa y la Convención Constitucional. Estos son dos eh, sistemas deliberativos como los que os ha presentado Arancha, que lo que han estado es durante bastantes años proponiendo reformas a la Constitución. Entonces, eh, David es el, eh, digamos, el, el director que ha estado investigando todo este proceso desde el origen hasta el día de hoy. Tenemos la suerte de tenerle aquí. Además, eh, tenemos a alguien muy especial, que es Luis Catwell, que es una participante de, un, de una de las asambleas. En concreto es una de las asambleas más conflictivas porque es la que abordó el tema de, de la enmienda, de la, de la octava enmienda. De, bueno, ahora lo van a explicar mejor porque yo no lo conozco exactamente cómo fue, pero fue, fue la, 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 la enmienda de la de abortion amendment. Yes. Es la, la, la enmienda que finalmente eh, se llevó a referéndum el cambio eh, y que a todos nos llegó, todos nos llegó en, en los periódicos y todos lo pudimos ver cómo había un referéndum. Pues ese referéndum venía de una asamblea, una asamblea irlandesa y tenemos aquí a una participante. Entonces, eh, bueno, por favor, un, un fuerte aplauso otra vez para ellos. Eh, no sé, y vamos, eh, vamos a comenzar con, con David, que va a hacer una breve introducción. Eh, le invito, eh, si quiere, a que, a que venga aquí. You can come here if you want. Nos va a hacer una, un, una introducción de cuál era el, el contexto en el que surge este, este, este proceso en Irlanda y, y bueno, cómo se inicia. ¿no? Vamos a empezar con, con él. Muchas gracias. All right, um, good morning everyone. Um, Iago, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you. And um, please can I congratulate you and your colleagues on organizing what is clearly a, a wonderful event and it's, it's quite a privilege to have a chance to speak to you. Um, the, the event is very well controlled as I, I'm sure you know better than I know. So I have been told that I have to speak for no more than 10 minutes, otherwise the microphone will be switched off. Um, and then turn over to Louise and then I will return. So I'm just giving a little bit of an introduction to the Irish process, which you have gathered from the very useful introduction earlier on, is, um, is both very modern and very old. So it's very modern in the sense that it is applying um, sortition and deliberation to a very important set of policy questions. But it is very, it is very old fashioned in the sense that we don't use much new technology. This is face to face deliberation. But I want to set the context, and you have had time to have a look at the slide uh, behind me. I know the, um, the quality is not great, and I apologize. Um, but it's just to show you the start of the process. And in, a, in, a, in, a, in part, I want to give you a bit of a personal story about, about myself here. So I was very fortunate that in 2004, I was invited to British, British Columbia in Canada to um, talk to the Citizens' Assembly of British Columbia about electoral systems. I write a textbook on electoral systems. I'm an academic, that's, that's what I do. And that was my first introduction to citizens' assemblies. And so I, I had a sense that this was rather an interesting method, deliberation involving sortition, a random selection of regular citizens being brought into the room to discuss important topics and to make recommendations. 
So in 2009, I returned to Ireland after 20 years working in Britain. I returned just in time to be in the middle of a, the worst recession, the worst economic crisis in the history of our state. So I know Spain had an economic crisis, but I want to be macho about this. Ours was much worse than yours. We had a very, very bad economic crisis. You can see Ireland was one of the wealthiest countries in Europe before 2008. And by the time I returned in 2009, we were now one of the poorest countries in Europe. We were so badly affected. So there was a lot of anger on the street. A lot of citizens, just like in Spain and in Portugal and in Greece, a lot of citizens were very angry about what the government had done. So I was part of a small group of political scientists who started to make the case for a citizens' assembly. And our rationale was very simple. It was, we should bring the citizens who are angry about what has happened into the room. They should be part of the conversation in terms of how we can fix our politics and make our politics more effective. So we were writing opinion pieces, we were appearing on the radio and on television, and we were talking about citizens' assemblies and how they could work in Ireland. And we were, we were being attacked continuously, and I'm sure there are people in this room who will be familiar with the arguments of critics. They will say, you cannot trust ordinary citizens, they're too stupid. Um, we already have a citizens' assembly, it is our parliament. Why do you want to waste public money on things like this? So we kept on arguing our, our case and saying we need to do this, and again, we kept on being pushed back. And then we had this wonderful opportunity that came to us, this organization called Atlantic Philanthropies, uh, which was set up by a very wealthy Irish-American called Chuck Feeney, and they gave us some money. So they came to us and they said, okay, you political scientists, you've been talking about a citizens' assembly, you, you, you keep saying we can do it in Ireland, so why don't you go and do it yourselves? So they gave us money and we set up this organization called We the Citizens in 2011, and we operated for the whole year. And our method was very simple. It was to show how a citizens' assembly could actually operate in Ireland, to try and respond to the critics. So we ran a citizens' assembly, we produced a lot of important analysis, and then we met with the Prime Minister and we met with the leaders of all the political parties in Ireland, and we made the case for saying, to them, why, why don't you set this up now? Why don't you do it? Why don't we have a citizens assembly that is funded by the uh, taxpayers, funded by the Irish state, to actually look at serious constitutional reforms in our country? And they did. So in 2012, they set up the first of these two processes. Iago said there were two of them. This was the first. This was called the Constitutional Convention. And I'll say more about it in, 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 a, in a little bit later, but, but I just wanted you to get a, a sight of this. So this is, as I said, a very old-fashioned technique. It was a hotel ballroom, uh, 99 members sitting around tables for over one year discussing constitutional reform questions. I'll say more about, the, about some of the details. In this particular case, 33 of the members were members of parliament. 66 of them were citizens. So I'll talk more about that a bit later on. But before I turn to, to Louise, I want to reference the um, process that she was then involved with. So we have had two of these processes. 2012 to 2014 was the Constitutional Convention. And then again, in 2016, they set up a citizens' assembly. This time it was called a citizens' assembly. You may notice it's the same hotel. The only difference now is the carpet. Um, it's a different carpet. I don't know, you can't see it on this slide, but anyway, it's a different carpet, but it's the same hotel. They had very good Wi-Fi, which was important for um, making contact with the outside world while this was going on. But Louise was a member of, of, the, of this sort of process. So it was, it was a citizens like Louise who were um, selected in a random process by market research company, an opinion poll company, knocking on their doors and saying, you have been selected in a lottery to be a member of the citizens assembly. Would you like to come? And from what I understand, 90 to 95% of the people who had the door knocked on slammed the door in the face and said, no, thank you. I have better things to be doing, doing with, with my life than coming to this. But Louise was one of the ones who, who did agree to come and, and was a member. And I'm going to hand the mic over to her now so that she can say a bit. Hi, so my name is Louise Caldwell. Um, 
I don't come from an academic background. I have no political experience. Um, I would say even my interest in politics was quite low in general. Um, I would read the newspaper, but not really very well informed, okay? Um, and one day in August in 2016, I was at home with my children, and there was a knock on the door, and there was a man with a clipboard, and he started to ask me questions, and I was thinking, what's he trying to sell? Is he selling me something? I don't know what this is about. So he said in the middle of it, he said something about the Eighth Amendment, and I thought, oh, I know what that is. That's, that's to do with the abortion uh, laws in Ireland. And I knew I fundamentally disagreed with our abortion laws in Ireland. So for anybody who doesn't know, in Ireland there was no case for abortion, regardless of the health of the mother, the life of the mother, there was never allowed abortion, in no case. So I listened to the rest of his questions and most of it was just to clarify that I had no political activism past or anything like that. I think that would have excluded me from, from participation. And so he went. And later that night, my husband, I was explained to him very badly. I said, there was a guy here. I've agreed to do something. It's every weekend for a year. He's like, every weekend for a year? I was like, yeah, you have to take the children every weekend. I'm going to a hotel. It's going to be great. Don't worry, you'll be fine. So, um, so yeah, so there was a big time commitment. Later, I learned it was just one weekend per month for a year. So it was a bit different. So. Um, so my first day at the Citizens' Assembly was very much an introduction day. Uh, there was a, so the layers of organization was there's the, the parliament who gave the instruction to set up a secretariat. So the secretariat organized the Citizens' Assembly. They were the administration. They were senior civil servants who were seconded to the Citizens' Assembly to run it. Um, and this was their second time to do it, so they had some learning and some experience from the previous time. Um, so we arrived and it became very apparent very quickly that they were very well organized. Um, all of the paperwork was very well organized, all of the instructions. So that was really useful um, because as a group we were a little bit like the rabbit, you know, in the lights of the car because we didn't know what exactly we were, we were there to do specifically. Um, so there was a lot of time spent explaining to us how it was going to work, how our input was required. Um, so the first day, there was the secretariat, and then we organized a steering group. So this was a smaller group of participants in the assembly who met separately after each, um, after each uh, weekend. So the first weekend was explaining the current situation in Ireland from a legal point of view and from a medical point of view. And then really it was put over to us um, to decide what we needed to hear next in order to help us to further the discussion. So in that regard, we really did feel very early on that our participation not only was important, but that it was crucial to how the development of the argument was going to go. Um, so so that, that was really it. That's, that, that takes us up to the, the point of our first day. Um, I have some more, some more notes, but I think that it's, it's going to be after David uh, speaks to the next piece. So that's how I arrived at the Citizens' Assembly, and then David will explain to you how it worked. I've just noticed the slides are a little bit um, off-center. No, it's okay. I mean, I could talk for a bit and then if there's a way of fixing. So if I say a little bit about um, how they work while, while you're working on the slides, you, you will have gathered a certain amount of this. Um, the pictures you've seen on both slides, are they're all in the hotel ballroom, so it's a plenary session. So about half of the time they were in plenary session where all the microphones were on and there were cameras in the room and the media were in the back of the room, so it was very public. But of course, in a deliberative process, you want, as we heard earlier on, the space for calm, reflective dialogue. And so a lot of the time was spent, it might be easier just to look at it like that, a lot of the time was spent um, in small group deliberation where there were facilitators, every table, the citizens were at, at tables of about seven or eight members at each table. And there was a, there was a trained facilitator for every table and there was a, a note taker for every table. Um, 
can leave it like that. I can. Yeah, if you go back a little bit. Got, got to go back a few slides. The wonders of technology. This is one of the reasons why the Irish process was kept very simple and stripped down. Tell me here. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Siago. Um, so trained facilitators at every table and no takers. And that meant that when they were doing the deliberation, the cameras were switched off, um, the journalists had to leave the room, and the citizen members, the members of the, of the process, were able to deliberate privately without anyone witnessing what they were doing. So if you go to the next slide. My assistant is moving us along. So now I will talk about the two processes in a little bit more detail. So the first process I mentioned to you earlier on from 2012 to 2014 was the Constitutional Convention. And as you can see, a third of the members were politicians. So every political party represented in Parliament was able to send politicians um, to be members of this, citizens, of, of this Constitutional Convention. And they all cooperated. And it was based on how many seats they had in Parliament. So we had government ministers, we had party leaders, we had very junior politicians and very senior politicians, and they were sitting at the same table. They were very carefully distributed around the room with the citizens, and it was first name terms. So it didn't matter how senior the politician was. If his name was Jerry, he was called Jerry. If her name was Mildred, she was called Mildred. There was no standing on airs and graces. Everyone had an equal voice because this is so important in a deliberative process. You can see the agenda. These were the items that they had to discuss. So this was sponsored by the government. It was set up by the government, by the Department of the Prime Minister. So it was the politicians who set the agenda. And some of the topics I'm happy to go into in the question and answer session if you want, but some of the topics, as you can see yourself, are not terribly exciting. But some of them are very exciting. Marriage equality is a very exciting one. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, and then you see the outcomes. So, so much as Louise was saying, in the process that follows this one. This went on for over one year with these members coming back roughly once a month to discuss these topics. They kept on coming back and they made a number of recommendations and this was the deal. The recommendations went back to the parliament and the parliament then followed through. So this is still happening today. This is still ongoing. We had a referendum on, um, on blasphemy only a few weeks ago. So only a few weeks ago, we had a referendum on blasphemy, which followed from this process, a recommendation in 2013. So it's, this is still happening today. But of course, the big referendum that we had, if you go to the next slide, was this one. Iago mentioned earlier on about the abortion referendum, but we already have had another one. In 2015, Ireland became the first country in the world to vote by a referendum to introduce gay marriage. And that came from a deliberative process. So it was the recommendation of the Constitutional Convention, went back to Parliament. The politicians were encouraged by what they had heard in this deliberative process, so they agreed to have the referendum. The citizens voted by a huge majority, almost two-thirds of the citizens voted in favour of marriage equality. So that was the first big headline outcome of a deliberative process. If we continue on then, now we get to the process that Louise will talk a bit more about in, in, in a moment or two the most recent Citizens' Assembly. And as Iago mentioned earlier on, and Louise also, it discussed abortion. So just to say a little bit more about that, we introduced into our constitution in 1983, by a referendum, by two-thirds majority vote in 1983, a ban on abortion. This was the Eighth Amendment. This said that the right to life of the unborn was equal to the right to life of the mother, which effectively meant we could never have abortion in Ireland. So Ryanair made a lot of money having unfortunate women have to fly to Britain to have their abortions there because they could not have abortions in Ireland. That's still the case right now. Um, so the Citizens' Assembly was set up. This time it was only citizens, 99 citizens, again selected in a random process and again given a topic by the government. You can see the list of topics. Again, a very strange mix of some rather boring and stupid little topics, but some really important topics like climate change and abortion. And of course, as you heard earlier on, if you go to the next slide, they made a recommendation for abortion and a huge majority. This was shocking. I mean, right up to the day of voting, many of us were thinking this was going to be very close maybe. Two thirds, so it was two thirds in 1983 that put it in to the constitution. In, in last June of this year, it was two thirds that voted to take it out. So that was a very dramatic um, outcome. 
And right now in the parliament, there is a special committee on climate change that is considering the climate change recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly, which among other things was proposing carbon tax. So citizens were recommending to the politicians to introduce taxes to try and address the question of climate change. So we, we have to see how that plays out. So I, I just want to say a few things in conclusion um, before I hand the mic back to um, Louise. I want to sort of set a little bit of the context of what contribution um, these processes are making, at least in the Irish context. And I suppose the first way to look at this is to make the point that at least in Ireland, these processes are not designed to replace representative democracy. They're designed to work with representative democracy. So we have a system much like you will have here in Spain or whatever country you want to pick that you may come from, where traditionally um, whatever process of decision about a policy that has to come before the parliament, it might be pressure for, it might be from pressure groups, it might be um, a manifesto promise of a political party or something. But the matter is discussed in parliament, it is uh, deliberated on by the government, and then it goes straight to a decision either by a referendum or by a reform in new legislation, God bless you, new legislation in Parliament. So if you go to the next slide, what, what we have introduced, and a lot of this is by accident and by default, it's not by some grand design, but this is something that is now beginning to settle into the Irish context or institutionalize itself. Because as I say, we have had now two big examples, marriage equality, abortion, and, and actually a third example, blasphemy only a few weeks ago is that we're introducing a constitutional mini-public, a deliberative mini-public, right into the heart of things, so that the issue is now temporarily taken out of the representative process because it's such a tough thing. The politicians are not managing to deal with this. Abortion was a problem that was never going to go away. Temporarily given to a constitutional mini-public, the deliberations produce recommendations that go back into the representative process, and then a referendum is called. So that's, this is the first point about the contribution that has been made by, uh, by a process like this in the Irish context. It is encouraging the politicians. It is helping the politicians. The amount of times you hear it, politicians saying, particularly on the marriage equality and on the abortion topics, that they were persuaded by the evidence that they themselves witnessed or heard before the Citizens' Assembly, and they, they changed their own minds. And then my last slide is the second contribution because processes like this don't just influence the politicians, they also influence the citizens. And I know this because we've done some, um, some analysis. This is some analysis, this is just one tiny illustration of the analysis we're doing right now on the abortion referendum. But we did the same analysis, my colleagues and I, for the marriage equality referendum, where in a nationally representative opinion poll, we asked a number of questions on, of voters as they voted in the referendum. So this is on the day of voting in the referendum on abortion, and as you can see, there's huge awareness of uh, the Citizens' Assembly. Now, there's much more than this. We asked objective knowledge questions. So we asked the representative sample of Irish voters a series of questions about the role of the Citizens' Assembly. And the vast bulk, it was two-thirds to three-quarters of respondents got the objective knowledge questions correct. So there's, there's a, a knowledge. This is a bit like Oregon, as we're going to hear about later on. There is a knowledge in the representative process of the role of deliberative democracy uh, at the beginning of this. In questions where we ask about levels of trust, there's high levels of trust on the part of citizens. They trust processes like this much more than they trust politicians. I know that's not, not that hard, but nevertheless, it's interesting. And then the third and final thing I'll say is that when we carry out um, a statistical analysis of the vote to try and predict why people voted yes, in both the abortion referendum and in the marriage equality referendum, there's a statistical relationship between objective knowledge of the deliberative process and voting yes. In other words, the, 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 among the yes voters, there is, there is an, an awareness that a citizens' assembly had an important role in the calling of that question. So that's where I conclude at this stage that um, processes like this galvanize and encourage the politicians, but they also inform the the citizens. So I'll hand back to Louise at this stage. Thank you, David. Um, so I suppose I want to go back a little bit to the room, to the space where we all met as part of the Citizens' Assembly um, to talk a little bit about how did it work on a daily basis. Um, so 
we had a very clear charter of behavior, um, which was very important to the process because while you see some of the topics that we did debate were a little bit boring, you know, some of them were very emotional and obviously the one about abortion was very emotional and there was a lot of people in the room who were directly affected by it. So we had to be very cautious and very careful to have, you know, a respectful and yet honest uh, discussion. So we had a charter of behavior and then the tables were facilitated very closely. So, for example, in a group of eight people, you're always going to have different types of personalities. So maybe one person wants to spend the whole time talking and there's one person who finds it very difficult to speak and finds it difficult to say what they feel. So a very important part of the process, I believe, was that the facilitators had to ensure, and there was a note taker also, and the facilitator had to ensure that each person was specifically asked for their opinion at each time and that that person was given the time and the space to answer in a way that suited them. So it wasn't just the loudest people who were heard and their opinions that got noted. So that was really important, I believe. Um, the questions that we asked in the private session, so the majority of it was in public session. And then when we had the round table discussions, which was where I feel we progressed in, in, our, in our discussions, we were given a selection of conversation starters. Um, so these were questions, thoughts, ideas, thought-provoking statements um, that we were given. On average, there was a list of about eight, six to eight conversation starters for each of the roundtable discussions. This, I believe, was also a very important part because it greatly contributed to the quality of the discussion. That's not to say that maybe the quality would not have got there in the end, but it certainly helped to short circuit the quality of the discussions. So it focused our minds. Um, and I think they had to be careful that it wasn't an influence, but it was a tool to help to focus. So that, that was done very, very well. Um, and as Arantxa said earlier, you know, in the deliberative process, and this is what I learned through the process, you know, politics can be very polarizing. You know, you have a yes and you have a no. And that's what gets heard in the media. That's what a general citizen of a country hears every day is the yes, the no, the yes, the no. And maybe they like a little bit of yes and they like a little bit of no and they go, well, I don't know, what do I, what do I feel about this, okay? But what the Citizens Assembly did for me was, you know, it, it helped to seek common ground. And that was a really, really strong um, sense from our discussions that, the, the motivation of the people around the table was to find a common ground, was to make choices, was to come with some outcomes that were going to be useful, that were going to be, um, to progress the discussion. It wasn't to shut it down. It wasn't to, you know, have black or white answers. It was to progress. One of the main things I learned, um, and David alluded to this earlier, was that in a citizens' assembly, the way that we were chosen was completely random. So we did have a cross-section of all of the people of Ireland. They came from rural areas, from city areas. They were old, they were young. Um, some were educated, some were not educated at all. But what I learned was that every person, regardless, and regardless of where they arrived from, made a valuable contribution. And it's very easy to feel that, you know, maybe somebody's thought could be dismissed because, you know, that person, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, and I think we have a natural tendency to, to do that. We all have our biases. But I learned very strongly that you can never know where the gold is going to come in the discussions and where a statement or a question can be so powerful that it can speak to a large group that you assume maybe don't have an opinion on something. And that's what came out of the Citizens' Assembly, in my opinion. So how do I feel about the outcome? Um, obviously, we made our recommendations at the end of the process. We spent five weekends discussing the Eighth Amendment, which was the abortion topic. And at the end of that, we we made our list of recommendations on what we felt should be legal um, in terms of the terms, the timeframes, everything in, in Ireland. 
And the majority of the politicians and the media were completely shocked. They couldn't believe that we had gone so far with our recommendations from zero to very liberal uh, abortion changes, uh, law changes. They all said, Ireland is not ready for this change. This Citizens' Assembly, we don't know where we got them from, but they are not representative of Ireland. We don't know who they are or what have, how they've come to this. You know, what, what have they been telling them? You know, what have, and there was a lot of skepticism around, oh, it wasn't balanced. The discussion, you know, it was all very pro-abortion, um, which is not true because every weekend we had talks from legal experts, medical experts, lobby groups, you name it. And each weekend, the discussion had to be balanced. So if we heard somebody from a pro-choice, we also heard someone from a pro-life. So it was all very balanced. Um, so in the end, when the country went to a referendum, I think the Citizens' Assembly members felt vindicated, you know, that we were representative of the country and that the discussions that we had were mirrored in the discussions that happened then in the media. And then the Parliament had a mini-assembly, I believe. It was a committee. Um, and this helped to educate them, helped them to have the, the broad range of views and the broad range of implications of the changes that we were recommending. And that helped the discussion. Um, um, yeah, and so I think what was interesting in the final point is what was really interesting was if you look at the statistic, you look at the number of our vote versus the vote of the Assembly versus the vote of the people of Ireland, and it was almost identical in terms of the percentage split. So we were representative, and I think as a tool for future, um, for future parliamentary and, and democratic change, I think it's really valuable. Eh, bueno, yo me he emocionado, no sé vosotros, pero bueno, eh, eh, es, un, es momento de preguntas, tenemos un ratillo para, para preguntas, entonces, si por favor alguien me echa un cable con esto, eh, tenemos bastantes preguntas, eh, vamos a ir... Eh, Hola, buenos días. Sergio Millares, del Ayuntamiento de Las Palmas, concejal del Ayuntamiento de Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. Dos dudas. Primero, felicitar por, lo que, por el proceso irlandés, me parece modélico. Dos dudas. Criterio de selección para la Asamblea Ciudadana. Si se utilizó un sistema absolutamente aleatorio o se buscaron perfiles por edad, por sexo, por condición social, por situación territorial. ¿Qué criterios se utilizaron? Porque quería entender antes a Luis que se excluyó a gente por su activismo político. Y entonces me gustaría... Y en segundo lugar, ¿qué continuidad puede haber en el sistema? Porque en este sistema de democracia deliberativa, porque está claro que el sistema político irlandés abrió, eh, abrió la, el sistema a la ciudadanía por la crisis. ¿Qué, qué garantías de continuidad para cuando se estabilice el sistema o cuando se esté estabilizando el sistema, cuando los indicadores económicos, sociales, políticos mejoren y, y, y se atenúen los efectos de la crisis, qué garantía de continuidad puede haber en esta Asamblea Deliberativa de Ciudadanos y Ciudadanas. Gracias. ¿Dos preguntas más? Hi. Over here. Uh, Michael from Tel Aviv, I wanted to ask you if you think that this tool is, for, for what kind of uh, decisions or policies is this relevant? Is it more for um, uh, general decisions, I would say, like the one you presented, or maybe for also more specific decisions that have to do with budgets and, uh, and programs? Vamos con una más. 
Hello, uh, David from France. Uh, I like how do, how do you cho I like to know how do you choose experts uh, in this kind of uh, sortition process? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna. So we, we're doing a double act here, and we're learning how we do it. Um, I start with the first one. It was a it was a stratified random selection. I, I should stress this was run by civil servants. So the idea was sold to the government. Once the government bought the idea, they then ran it. So civil servants decided all the decisions about how to do it. So they commissioned an, a market research company and they gave them the brief to find 99 citizens in a stratified random process. Uh, I won't pretend it was perfect, but it was pretty good. Um, and yes, you're correct, they were anxious, particularly because the first topic was going to be abortion. They were anxious to avoid the danger, as they saw it, of having people who had been politically active in campaigning on abortion on either side in the room, so they, they made sure to try and avoid having those there. That was their decision. Um, uh, I'll come back, I'll, I'll hand to Louise for the, your question about uh, continuity in a second. Michael from Tel Aviv, um, more for your, yeah, so, the, the argument about where you can use processes like this is still very much a developing argument. I always use this example that my buddy from British Columbia, Ken Carty, makes. Uh, he makes this argument that you would not want to fly an airplane designed by Citizens' Assembly. And I think that that shows the limits. So there are limits in terms of degrees of technicality that perhaps a, processes, a process like this cannot do so well. But that doesn't mean you can't break technical issues down in some way or another. But I think the, the most important point is processes like this work best when there's a value-laden question. So what are the underlying values? Um, th that's the one that, where it really can play an important role in helping to open up the dialogue. Um, and then maybe I'll hand over to you, and if there's anything else, I'll come back. So you asked about what guarantee do we have about continuity of a process like a citizens' assembly. I think from discussions I've had with just people, friends, not anybody in the political sphere, um, they seem to have an opinion now and an idea that this form of democracy is now a part of how we make decisions in Ireland. So I feel like we've passed through a valve that we can't go back on now. It's closed behind us. We can only go forward. And I feel that this particular type of process, I think that if we try to make big political change in the future and we don't have this, I think what you're going to find is you're going to have a lot of people saying, why was this not done with the Citizens' Assembly? Why is this being done this way? Um, and as David mentioned, you know, if you look at the statistics at the exit poll there where was it 66% of people are, are now aware of what a citizens' assembly is? I mean, that's huge. That's, you know, almost two-thirds of, of, our, of our population are now aware of this and aware of the value for social change. So, so I, don't think, I don't think it can go backwards, but I, that's hopeful, I suppose. I agree. Just David had a question from France uh, about the experts, and maybe Louise will say something as well. So the experts were chosen by um, an expert. There was an expert advisory group that was established. So when they discussed abortion, the expert advisory group had ethicists, doctors, and lawyers who worked very closely with the secretariat and with a steering group that consisted of members of the assembly. And they were the ones that between them picked the experts. So is that it? Okay. Um, no tenemos más tiempo para preguntas. Lo sentimos. Hay, hay más que... Hay muchas, además. Entonces, eh, vamos a proceder al siguiente panel. Yo pido, por favor, un aplauso para David y Luis. Gracias.